I was reading books on the brain, neuroscience, and um, I came across the word Umwelt, and that's the way a biological organism travels through the world. The way my human, this human person, <laughs> traveled through Earth 12, 15 years ago is completely different than the way I see the world now. I'm able to see more of what is in fact here on Earth. When I, in my book, I call it Schizopedia, the place I'm accessing. Mm. Since then, I, I, you know, it's like, am I looking at the Kashuk record? Is it the newosphere? Is it the book of life? Well, I've called it a hidden biosphere before, an invisible mm -hmm. biosphere that I can access and I can see things there and I can interact. Welcome back to the transmission, my friends. Obviously, we all want to believe that this isn't all there is, that there's more to reality than what we see, that there's at a minimum some purpose, some logic that we're not normally aware of. I myself, and I know many of you, have had, let's call it, moments of high or at least medium strangeness that suggests that that might be the case, that there is some uh, unseen order we're not normally aware of. You know, moments of synchronicities you can't ignore, uh, maybe mind-altering molecules or meditative experiences that lead to significant reality quaking. But what if one day you actually woke up with a new ability or new mode of perception? that seem to be a portal into a real unseen realm, one that's invisible to us most of the time, but really seems to be there. Well, this is apparently exactly what happened to our guest in this mind meld, Tom Matt. He was a successful advertising executive with a family, but it all came crumbling down when he, uh, just to nutshell it, went on an epic drug bender and had an ensuing psychotic break. This led to a period of extreme hardship, estrangement from his family, struggle, and also high weirdness, but eventual recovery and reconciliation with his family. But Tom's story doesn't stop there. Even after a decade of sobriety and being a functioning member of society, something about Tom's perception was fundamentally different, permanently. He was able to see and interact with what seemed to be hidden layers of reality, see what look like mathematical objects, fields, higher geometry, possibly even beings. And before you say, okay, so he's hallucinating. You just said this guy was psychotic. There's probably something wrong with his brain. That doesn't seem to be the case. Tom has had MRIs, numerous exams. Nothing seems to be wrong with Tom's brain. Most important of all, and this is what really got my attention, there is a study in peer review right now about Tom's abilities, which confirms that he really does seem to be seeing and interacting with something mysterious. So Tom calls this new mode of perception upside, and he believes he may not be unique, that there may be others out there with this ability, and that maybe we can all learn it, at least to some extent. And he thinks it might even be a tool for unlocking some key mysteries about consciousness, maybe even the nature of reality itself. We talk about all of the above and more, the link between what Tom is experiencing and Jung, uh, ancient esoteric wisdom, the phenomenon of consciousness itself, a tale of true high weirdness or two, all of the necessary portals for Tom, his study, uh, his ability, his book, they're all in the description. Same for third eye drops. On that note, my friends, tickle that algorithm currently with a like, a sub, a comment, a share. It is of the utmost importance, and it recently came to my attention. A large number of you, even returning viewers, remain unsubscribed. Why? By the way, we've also got a back catalog of hundreds of audio-only mind melds with truly brilliant beings, but you can only hear those on podcast platforms, so do subscribe there. And if you want to go deeper, if you want to riff on, I guess, the high weirdness of humaning, join us over at patreon.com forward slash third eye drops. We've got a patron only discord server. We do zoom hangs, a book club, you get rewards and it's the best way to support the show. So join me and hundreds of other wonder dippers at patreon.com forward slash third eye drops. And with that, my friends, let's meld minds with Tom Matt. Welcome into the mind meld. You are a very unique person from from what i've been able to ascertain at least i i don't mean this to sound 
like it's inevitably going to sound, but I get so many emails and so many claims that it's just like a lot of the time it's, what is this now? I, I don't, okay. But something about your email really stuck in my mind and I came back to it two or three times. And then I followed up and really looked into it and I was like, hmm, this is interesting. This is really interesting. So I, I can't wait to dive in to this whole conversation and where I know it's going to shotgun out into with you because the implications of it are insane. Your story is insane. And I can't wait to rib with you on it. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited. So speaking of your story, let's riff on the background a little bit because, yeah, I don't even want to introduce it. Why, why don't you just tell people what precipitated all of this and what you went through? Okay, let's let's talk about why I think I'm here, which is I have this ability, which I call upside vision, and it is the ability to see and interact with holographic images that are everywhere around me, us. Okay, everywhere I shift my attention and something will be in focus. It'll be a holographic image. I can interact with it. Um, and actually, I should probably describe what these look like so the listeners or audience can get a good idea. And usually to the descriptions I use, most people have seen at least one of them. So when I say they're holographic images, a couple of years ago on Netflix, there was a show called The Queen's Gambit. Mm -hmm. In it, the protagonist would lay on the bed at night. She would look up at the ceiling and she would see chess pieces moving. She was a chess master. And she would think about the move she was going to use against her next uh, contestant. And she would see this in her field of vision. And she would use this to help gain an advantage. That's what they look like. If you've not seen that, most people have seen the Iron Man movies. Tony Stark is in his office, right? He's submersed in this three-dimensional holographic universe that is everywhere around him. It is like that. Now, I can't swipe my arm, you know, left and right and find files, but I can engage with these images. So that is what we're talking about, what it looks like. It is immersive. It is extraordinarily detailed. Um, and I can engage with them. Now, although it's detailed, they aren't necessarily true. Right. So even though something is detailed, it may not be correct. Like I could see a circulatory system inside a body, but I don't know if it's mm. really the circulatory system. It looks like that. So that's what it looks like. Now, this happened. This ability, uh, acquired ability came about after a dozen years ago. I went through a severe mental health crisis, addiction, um, psychosis, delusion. It got so bad. I walked out on my wife, my kids and my business because I thought my kids were alien doppelgangers. I thought my business was a front for another business. I thought I was being followed by government satellites. So I had a very real psychotic break from reality, right? I ended up being homeless um, in Los Angeles uh, and checking myself into a psychiatric teaching hospital. Long story, and that book, I have a book called Jesus Goes to Hollywood, A Memoir of Madness. It's on Amazon if you, you're interested. It talks about that part of it. And the first two thirds is kind of that part. And the last third um, is about me trying to find out what happened. Because at the end of this event, I was sitting on the couch one day and I was looking over and I did see these holographic images. And look, and I didn't know, and I'm just coming out of this delusion. So I'm still del delusional, yeah, right? Yeah. I still have psychotic thoughts, thoughts that if I would tell you them now, you're like, that's obviously untrue. Now, when this happened, I'm like, okay, for whatever reason, I knew that I would be able to see these things without the drugs. Mm -hmm. As important, I knew if anybody was going to take me seriously, I 100% had to get clean and sober right? Which I also wanted to do to build my relationship with my family. So that's what happened. A year of psychotic, a psychotic break, my brain literally broke, somehow we rewired. And in the rewiring, something opened up and I have been given this extraordinary ability. Um, and I've been living with it ever since looking for answers. So that's where we are now. And um, I can keep going to tell you to make sure we understand it's not a vivid mind's eye. Yeah. I think it's very important for the listener to understand. It is not um, high fantasia. It's not a vivid mind's eye. Now, why do we know that? Well, as an advertiser, I had a vivid mind's eye before. You know, I had to think about uh, taglines and images and laying out images and stuff like that. And another way from a real world, if you and I are driving in a car, Michael, if you and I are driving... 
And you said, Tom, you know, think about the Jaws poster. When I was a kid, I could think about this Jaws poster and I could still drive the car, right? Mm -hmm. I, I don't have to shift my attention. If I was using upside vision, I cannot drive the car because it's my, my eyes need to engage with these waves. I call them waves that are outside of me. And I can't do both. Now, if I was a passenger in the car, I could do it, but I couldn't do it driving. And there's a couple of other ways we know that this starts externally. It's not always external. We'll get to that. A um, couple of ways. Number one, my eyes get tired focusing on these images the same way your eyes get tired from reading a book or watching a movie. Um, my pupils dilate when I see something arousing or exciting, right? Yeah. You cannot, it's not, it's impossible for a human to willfully dilate their pupils. It has to come from an external stimuli. So that's how we know it's external. And then another way is there's something called smooth pursuit eye movements. When you're tracking something, right? If your eyes actually following it, you can't fake it. You know what I mean? So if you fake it, they're stochastic, they jump. So in other words, if you were sitting next to me and we were looking at what we would consider a blank wall and I see in upside vision, a gazelle run across the savanna, you'd be able to see my eyes and track it. So those are the ways we know starting it's external. That said, once I have engaged with this, let's see, I see a gazelle running across the savanna. I can think um, a, a lion come from a rind behind a tree and catch the gazelle. Yeah. Now, now it's a conversation. Right. Now I'm having a conversation <clears throat> with this thing and I am a participant with it. Right. So that way, you know, and I've been living with it for a dozen years. And even now, when I tell you this, I am in awe of it as, you know, somebody listening to it. And it's, it's extraordinary. Yeah. We can talk about all the uh, different elements of it. And is it meaningful? Um, is it, like I said earlier, is it true? How does it engage with our real world? But that's the kind of playing field or that's the, that's what I've been dealing with for the last dozen years. So interesting. So interesting. A, a couple of just procedural questions. And then I want to get into the, what it could be, what it makes me think of philosophically and thematically, because there's so much. Um, but so when you have these experiences, could it just happen to you right now while we're talking and you have to like tune it out? Or is it something you have to be in the right kind of mind to initiate? Like, do you have to get into a more calm state or how does it, how does it come about? No, it's actually the opposite of tuning it out. I have to tune it in. I have to shift my attention and focus and something will be there. Now, mm. I could do this now if you wanted, or we could do it later, you know? Um, but let's try it later. Let's okay, try it later. Okay, so, yeah, because sure. yeah, I can do this uh, and, and it may be interesting. And let me tell you why that's kind of fun is because typically there's a synchronistic element of it. It mm. may be related to you personally, Michael, or yeah. it may be related to somebody listening to this show at that moment. So we'll do that later. But yeah. um, no, I just have to tune it in. I have to tune it in, not tune it out. So in the beginning, when I was, when I'd go to bed, right, I'd shut my eyes and there would be something there. And it's not always nice. It's not kind. Sometimes these are horrible images, but I would be like, well, this is bad. I, I, it was very quickly realized, okay, just imagine or pull into a vision, the side of a stream, the ocean side. So that's what I'll do typically when I go to bed. Um, there's a word called umwelt. Are you familiar yeah, with that? Yeah, yeah, umwelt. Yeah, I've I've actually mm -hmm. shared that on on social media before. Yeah. Okay, so so when I was doing research on this, <clears throat> I was reading books on the brain, neuroscience, and um, I came across the word umwelt, and that's the way a biological organism travels through the world. Mm -hmm. Now, the human umwelt is different from, let's say, a worm or a snake or a bird. Now, if a worm started, you know, is a worm, and we all share, share the same environment. But the worm does not see, does not talk. So right. it's umvel or the way it shares the environment is much less than ours. The way my human, this human person who <laughs> traveled through earth 12, 15 years ago is completely different than the way I see the world now. Right. For whatever reason, my umvel expanded and I'm being able to see, I'm able to see more of what is in fact here on earth. We yeah. could talk about extra dimension, hidden dimension, but yeah, I'm seeing more of what is here. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely want to talk about all of the above, including expand upon this notion of seeing more than what's here, because that's a rich one too. But j before, before we get there, when did you personally know that whatever this is was not like an echo of 
I mean, in some ways, it it is an echo of of what happened to you. But when did you start to think, okay, this is not like a normal hallucination. This is not part of a like a paranoid schizophrenic delusion. This is something else, and I don't know what this is or or what's labeled to put on this. So good. Yeah, great. So when I had it done, obviously I was like, okay, I mean, I've seen enough movies. Um, I have a, I've got this gift, but it's going to come with a curse. It's a tumor and I've got six months to live. I really <laughs> did think that, right? So I've had two MRIs. There is no stroke, lesion, tumor, or damage from do- drug use. It is an all clear as far as my brain state goes. Not only that, they can't find anything, w- w- anything wrong or anything that would be showing um, why this would be happening. Yeah. So from a clinical perspective, th- I mean, and this is so not helpful. <laughs> Listen, we don't know what happened. Obviously, your drug use must have opened something in your brain and it stayed open and changed the way, you know, your brain works. Okay. Right. That's not helpful. Yeah. It's really an answer. And, and we know, again, it's 12 years. So yeah. I was on a search then to, okay, study hallucinations, learn all about hallucinations, learn all about neuroscience in the brain and get answers. It took me literally a dozen years, actually, it took, Dean Radin at the Ions Noetics yeah. Institute yeah, yeah. finally responded um, in 2021 or 2022, late 2022. And I got into a lab last year to see, to measure my EEG waves while I'm using Upsight. There was going to be a study done at the Smith Kettlewell Eye Institute. I say going to be, we were on early talks pre COVID Mm -hmm. and I was going to get in an MRI there and they were going to see what area lights up while I was doing it, but that all fell apart and never. Let's do that. that. Yeah. So we know, I know there's no damage. You know what I mean? We know it's not that. And also look, it took a minute for my family. They're like, Tom, you sure you're not psychotic? It took a long time. Um, for them to be like, okay, no more symptoms, no more delusions, no more false beliefs, but this is open and this is different and this is something else. Clearly they were related, right? There was some some crossover, yeah, yeah. Um, something broke. I, I used to say I broke with my brain with drugs. Now I see things you don't. You know, maybe that's true, but now I just say I see things you don't you know, because yeah. it's like, I, I don't know. Obviously that was a part of it, but there's so much more than that. Yeah. I think that's a I think that's a good summary. And and I think I, I want to emphasize the fact that, and I said this to you before the recording, that you're the type of person who is truly is cl- it's clear to me, is seeking answers on this through through any vector available. And and it seems like you're placing a large emphasis on science. Like you want you want to get in labs, you want to be hooked up to things, you want to demonstrate that there's really something going on here. And we didn't specifically mentioned this yet, but there is a study in peer review right now through IONS regarding you and and what you experience. And I looked at the the abstract of it and the summary of it. And it's clear that there are brain state changes associated with whatever you're experiencing. Um, let's talk a little bit about the specifics of how they did that study, because I, I think I understand the gist of it, but I, I'd like to hear from from your perspective exactly what they did and what that experience was like. Sure. So I was up there last summer um, and we did 200 tests, 200 random tests. And we were t- two, two conditions. Mm-hmm. First condition was the control, let's call it my mind's eye. So they would show a picture, let's call it the Statue of Liberty, and then the picture would go away and I would have to think about, mem- yeah. remember what it looked like in, with my mind's eye. The next picture call it Eiffel Tower. I would see it and then I would, I would see the picture and then I would have to see the picture with upside vision, right? So we did 200 of tests like that, whatever they were, random picture, I didn't know it was coming. Um, and that's what this report about was. And it was reporting about the brain states, all the EEG brain states, alpha, gamma, theta, beta, all of them with the before and after. Now, what was so amazing to me um, if, well, I'll explain it. Cause I, again, I don't know all the deep, deep science because I'm not a scientist, but I do know this cause I've studied enough about it. The alpha brain state is the brain state we're in when our brain is relaxed. 
Yeah. Okay. So you would think that even while um, while you were I was sitting there using upside or not, it would still be relaxed. But that was the brain state that showed the biggest change. Yeah. Um, from before, it lit up like I say, it lit up like Rudolph's nose. It was just it really, but it wasn't red though. It's blue. That's how they. That's how they have the visuals to represent it. Um, it was such a big change. Now I thought going in that the theta state would be the one that would lit up the most because mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. the dreaming state right now there were differences let's be clear but the uh, the alpha state was extraordinary there were there were differences across all of the brain states the theta wave, wave state was definitely a difference and that's dream state and that's the state mediums that's the state that they measured people that call themselves mediums they yeah, see yeah. activity going on when they're in that state so that's basically the result the the results again they were across all the um brain states what it means you can read the paper to see what it means um again it was it was in fact a surprise to me because well yeah. i know my brain is working let's be clear i know my brain is working and my eyes are getting tired as i said earlier yeah. so interesting yeah it uh, seemed it seemed like from what i was reading that there's a, a marked increase in arousal like in the same way where if if you were actually out there navigating with something in the world that's what your brain was looking like from from my brief reading and it was and it was actually showing a faster moving brain wave so like like you said you know alpha is often associated with relaxation or meditation or sometimes even slower moving waves in alpha but when you're in the world and you're and you're like okay where am i going i got to pay attention to this what's that over there then you're in more like a beta or maybe even gamma state and it seemed like you were from what i recall you were in more of an aroused state as if you were really interacting with something that was there does that sound that's exactly Correct. right. Yeah. So, okay. One hundred percent yeah. right. And when I emailed these, when I emailed all these lab directors and scientists for the last dozen years, I'm like, I can do this in a lab all day long because I could do it at home all day long for hours and hours yeah. and hours if I want to. When I was actually out there in the lab, I was like, I need to rethink this because it's really tiring to do yeah. it under these conditions. Um. So yeah, that's kind of funny, but yes, absolutely. My yeah, brain it, is working very hard. And it's the opposite of what I would have thought too, because I, I imagine you almost like some kind of oracle or something that goes into some kind of relaxed trance state and just starts, you know, seeing this stream of whatever you want to call it. And maybe now we can start to get into some of the ideas about what it might be or what we could call it. But yeah, that, that surprised me as well. So, uh, so now that I think we've kind of laid the groundwork, what happened to you, how you know this isn't just <clears throat> an artifact of some psychotic episode, the fact that you've studied it, the fact that there does seem to be real hard evidence that you're experiencing something. Let's get to the fun stuff of what you think this is personally, what you've looked into and, and what seems the warmest to you in terms of what you think is going on. Okay. That's good. So this ability I call upside, right? The ability to see holographic images and interact with them interact with them. When I, in my book, I call it schizopedia, the place I'm accessing mm, because, cool. because, well, it was, it, it, it is, but because it, it was little, you know, schizophrenics hear things, they see things. Wikipedia has got some knowledge, but that wasn't always true. As I said earlier, Th that was a dozen years ago. Since then, I, I, you know, it's like, am I looking at the Kashuk record? Is it the newest fear? Is it the book of life? Uh, I call it the organic metaverse. All of these things I call it, but for this conversation, and I've kind of settled on this in the last, literally in the last just few weeks. Well, I've called it a hidden biosphere before, an invisible mm -hmm. biosphere, but I think there is a hidden biosphere. It's hidden to us. It's not hidden. It's invisible to humans. Other, it's, uh, uh, maybe other birds or something can see it. Other living things can see it. It's invisible to us that I can access and I can see things there and I can interact with them. Now, there's an element of extra dimensional, there's an extra dimensional piece of it too. Mm. Now, is that in addition to this hidden biosphere or is it also the hidden biosphere? And let me talk about that for a moment because it's extremely important for the structure of this place. When I came out of this psychosis, I was obsessed with mathematics, right? Yeah. I mean, literally. And I started reading all these books on the history of math, everything I could devour on mathematics. Now, it come to find out I am, let's call it an average undergraduate mathematician. Okay. I'm okay. Definitely, definitely okay. I can speak deeply about any mathematical um, idea. 
where I excel or where this lets me excel is this visual spatial Mm -hmm. piece to it. There is no image I can manifold topological space that I cannot deconstruct and rearrange in my field of vision and move it around. You can move it around actually like the Iron Man thing. Um, So over about four years ago, I was finally finished with this. So I would be shown these mathematical some equations, some structures, and I would have to figure it out, right? So there was this like pull or push, whatever you want to call it. When I answered, when I got through that level, I got another level and I got another level. And I have over time, there's been a five, I'll I'll call it a five plus multidimensional coordinate system that I literally sitting back here when the time is right, we can build it with software or whatever, mechanical engineer, we can literally build it and navigate it. Think of it like the um, Cartesian coordinate system on steroids. So this thing exists, right? In my, I don't want to say mind's eye because I told you it's not mind's eye, but it exists in my field of vision and I can build it in our, there you go, in our 3D world. And what we think of as our 3D world, I can really construct it. It will be difficult because they're very, it's got a lot of moving parts. It's fluid, but it's possible. Um, so the, the hidden biosphere, I think I, I, I'm interacting with, but there's also a dimensional element too. Are they related? Yeah. Sure, they're related. Man, okay. So now, now that I think you've, you've started to introduce some of these ideas, there, there's a whole host of ideas I want to see if you've looked into because I'm kind of obsessed. Although we were talking about, I do, I do have a lot of academics on the show. I do have a lot of people who, you know, are, are doing technical work, but I personally lean toward the more psycho-spiritual, mythopoetic, esoteric. So there's a when when I hear you talking, it's just impossible not to think about a few things. So first I have to ask if you've looked into Jung much, because I think I think Jung has some major insights into into what you're experiencing. Like um he early on in his career worked a lot with schizophrenic people and would sit and listen intently to what they were saying. Not, not in a way of trying to like, you know, Oh yeah, they're paranoid delusions, nonsense, but really things that would perk up his ears, things that he was interested in. Um, and actually maybe it wasn't, maybe this was later. I can't even remember when in his career it was now, but there's some famous anecdote of he was researching uh, something to do with either a myth or an alchemical text that had to do with an extremely sh- like strange image. And I believe it was the sun's, the phallus of the sun. So it was like the sun's penis. Okay. So he's reading about this like strange alchemical myth about the sun's penis. And then he goes um, and does the rounds with one of his patients. And the patient, the schizophrenic patient brings up the sun's penis or brings up the sun's phallus, like an extremely strange reference, right? And, and and that's one of the examples he cites of suggesting whatever people are experiencing in these altered, altered states of consciousness that, let's be clear, clearly are not a good way to go through life. It, it's not good to be in these states. However, it may not just be complete nonsense. It may be that there is some kind of information, archetypal information, unconscious information, information from wherever that essentially leaks into somewhere that it's not supposed to be, but that also doesn't mean that it's 100% not real. And everybody, I'm, I'm not giving license for everybody's insane schizophrenic delusions to be in some way real. But it also, I think, to just dismiss anything archetypal and unconscious as as pure nonsense and imagination is not right either. And what I suspect, and again, Jung has an answer for this, is that there is something that we can loosely call the unconscious and then also the collective unconscious, that there is this realm of ideas, of archetypes, of phenomena that we are connected to, but we we don't have control over. Like it's flowing into us all the time. And there are 
psychological and probably neurological gates that prevent that huge you know stream of information for from penetrating into our everyday reality but it's also real in a non-theoretical way like it's ontologically real right. at least in a way that is experiential and and I would also argue like a logical inevitability if you if you just walk it back so have so I guess before I continue ranting have you looked into Jung's sort of model of the psyche at all and has that shed light on any of this for you sure yes and so I have two things I want to make sure we come back to. Let's yeah. just come back to DMTs and psilocybin. Oh, and yeah, definitely. Group, yeah. And group hallucinations. Right. Yeah, I want to make sure we put that pin to that we're going to come to. Yes. And yes, yes, yes. Something <laughs> else on, on that note, I really wanted to run by you too. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so in my book, there is a moment. I am staying at the Beverly Hills Hotel, right? Beverly Hills, beautiful hotel, obviously. And I'm, by the way, I'm the executive function area of my brain. Um, is is not working. I empty out my bank accounts and I literally just spending money, not even thinking it. You know, yeah. it was insane. It was it was nonsense. You can't say anything anymore. It was a very unhealthy mental health breakdown. Um, what, what what happened was, and I had a limo driver. This is before Uber. I had a driver always on staff, but I ran was running out of money. So he told me, "Listen, I'll pick you up, but I'm going to pick you up in my car." And I'm not going to come up in the Beverly Hills Hotel where everyone picks up each other limos and stuff. I'm going to meet you at this side street. Now, this isn't done, right? This is yeah. this is not done. So, so the reason I'm telling setting the scene is because it's so it's so nonsensical that I'm actually dealing with this. I'm like, and I became friends with this guy. He's a really good, decent man, very nice man. Actually, helped me out a lot. So, I'm walking out of the Beverly Hills Hotel. My money is running out, and I want to be clear. I would try not to communicate with people at all at this time. Um, minimum communication. Right. I had my headphones in. I had like 1100 songs on I iTunes that I downloaded to my phone and I listened to them all the time. Just 1100 songs. As I'm walking from where you're supposed to get, pick up the limo down to the street, you're walking across this gla grass. It's very strange. Unless you're working there doing lawn work, mm -hmm. it's, it's just weird. This, um, and the song blinded by the light comes on by Bruce yeah. Springsteen. The fact that it's blinded by the light is not insignificant. Just like you talk about the sun's penis. It is not insignificant. One of my favorite things to talk about. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. So I'm walking towards it and every lyric in the song in one way or another was blocked to have some kind of real world response. Just let me give you two examples because I can two I can think of boulder on his shoulder. There's literally a guy working with a rock on his shoulder when that's wow. first came on. Uh, deuce, uh, a deuce. There's a literally one of those old deuce cars in the street, right coming down the road, right when the verse happened. And there was other things that I can't remember the exact one, but it lasted for about 40 seconds of the song. And I was almost in tears because at the t I was like, this is too extraordinary. At the time, I thought these government satellites were mocking me yeah. and they thought it was fun to tease me that we are complete control and you're just a pawn. And it was brutal, but g g paradigm shattering. But in that context, at that time, I was destroyed and it was all negative. I got to the car and, you know, my driver's like, what's wrong? He's like, nothing. I'll talk to you about it later. Looking back and, and, I, and I write about this in the book. I write about this in the book. In that moment, it was horrible. But it also showed me that, the, you know, young, this is young, this is synchronicity to the nth degree. If you did not pay attention to this, you were, you were something, you know, you would, you can't yeah, not pay yeah. attention unless you were not paying attention. So that happened all the time. I have many instances of that in the book, but um, that one was, again, paradigm shifting. It lasted so long. A synchronicity is a moment or a thing. This was like 40 seconds of a song. It was yeah. like it was blocked by a director. There was a movie called um, uh, Baby Driver. Yeah, yeah. I haven't seen it, but I know of it. In the opening sequence in Baby Driver, um, there is a scene when the credits are rolling, when the protagonist is walking through the downtown Atlanta and, and all of the verses are on the walls, like the billboards. And it, it felt like that, or he would pick up something. It was literally blocked by a director. And when I saw that, again, I got chill bumps. So it was so extraordinary. So to answer your question, without a doubt, in fact, I even take those as cues now that I'm going down the right mm -hmm. path or think I should make the right decision. 
about, you know, now I'll call that basic instinct, connect to conscious. If synchronistic things, if I'm shown synchronous, if I'm shown meaningful things, I know there's a synchronistic element in it and I should pay more attention. Yeah. Whether what that means is individualistic. Yeah. Yeah. Synchronicities are so interesting. And I've, I've done videos on them. I've done, you know, long conversations on the pod, largely orbiting that topic. And it's one that's so interesting because almost everyone has experienced it. Almost everyone has had some kind of quote unquote meaningful coincidence that is beyond chance, impossible to ignore. Um, and on the other hand, every time I talk about it, I get so many comments that are like, I have, I'm having 50, exp I'm having 50 synchronicities a day. I have so many synchronicities. That's not good. Like you, Jung is very clear himself that that's not good. He's very clear that there's a clear link between schizophrenic type issues and synchronicity. Um, like there's a quote I've pulled from him before, um, that I actually think is interesting for two reasons in terms of this conversation. And it's something to the effect of synchronicities that are, and I'm paraphrasing here because I don't remember this part exactly, but synchronicities that are like myopically individualistic where everybody thinks it's, it's happening, orbiting them and it's for them. And it's, it's, it's something that's orchestrated, you know, specifically for their ego that's probably schizophrenia. However, if you take synchronicity to be something that is like a example of what he calls in the quote, cosmic sympathy, like that there are these strange unseen relationships between the mind and the world, like what's going on around us and, and just things that we don't understand. Sometimes those things will make that will just scream at you and, and make it impossible to ignore. And Jung himself has so many examples of, you know, being deep into study on what, like, like the one I gave you is pretty synchronistic, um, between him and the, the schizophrenic. And, and by the way, we got to mention, it's like this, it's that crazy eclipse today. And we're talking about like the sun's <laughs> penis. That, that's kind of a weird coincidence in and of itself. But, um, I actually don't even know if I'm able to see that from where I am. I should probably look into that. I don't know what time it's even supposed to happen, but anyway, um, Oh, you're, are you talking to the song Blinded by yeah, the Light? By, the way, by Bruce Springsteen, yeah. I didn't think that was Bruce Springsteen. Well, they covered it. Uh, oh, they covered it. it. Okay. It that's covered, that's made it famous. Is. I can't think of their name right now. Okay. But the, okay. I, heard, I was listening to the Springsteen version because I had gotcha. Springsteen. Gotcha. Gotta have Springsteen. Okay. Glad, just, just needed to make sure. We were, <laughs> just needed to make sure. Um, so, so anyway, if we take this idea of sympathy or correspondence or that there are these hidden unseeable connections under normal conditions that implies a really big question right what what is it in reality that allows these connections to exist and if you keep walking back through jung this is another place that i really want to take you you eventually get to esotericism and esotericism largely is an echo of platonism so like platonic philosophy and if you try to trace a lot of the stuff we're talking about all the way back into the platonic dialogues, it all emanates from this one very mysterious platonic dialogue called the Timaeus. And I won't go, I won't launch into a big thing on this because I've done that way too much lately. But the Timaeus is the very beginning, or at least the, the captured beginnings of a lot of the ideas that today we would say are like esoteric or occult ideas. Things like there being a, a correspondence between microcosm and macrocosm. The idea that there is like this geometric and number mysticism, which is something that I know resonates greatly with you. Like the Platonists and the Pythagoreans who uh, Plato was influenced by, they were obsessed with numbers. They're obviously credited with like the Pythagorean theorem and whatever, but it, they weren't just obsessed with math because they thought it was cool. Like they literally believed that they were gleaning insight from the mind of God or from what they called the noose, N-O-U-S, um, and, and like the divine logos, right? Like the logic that was used by the divine mind to build the cosmos. So th this is why I'm saying like there are all these things that overlap with you, Tom, like the interest in, in numbers, the um, 
the correspondence piece of it, the, the psycho-spiritual piece of it with Jung. And when you roll all of that together, I feel like a lot of what you're experiencing makes a lot of downstream sense to me, at least. And I don't know if I did a, a good job of logically linking all of those things together and it makes sense in my mind, but I wonder if they're all in some way related that today, like you, like I feel like someone like you would have gone to Plato's Academy and been like, here's what I'm experiencing. Here's all the things that are going on. And they're like, yes, yes, yes. You need to come in here and, and we're going to like initiate you into all of these ideas and, and it's going to make perfect sense. But obviously we don't have that today. It's either you're, you're, it's so compartmentalized and, you know, a mile deep and an inch wide in terms of We'll look at your brain. We can tell you what your brain is doing. We can read a book by Jung. Well, it seems like it might be this, but there's no, there is no unifying philosopher who can take everything you're experiencing and make it make sense in a multidisciplinary way. So hopefully that com this conversation will somehow yield a, a little angstrom of that for you. But um, have you, have you ever looked into, to, to any of that? Like, are you familiar with any of these yeah, yeah, sure, of course. Plato yeah, platonic yeah. ideas? Yeah, of course. Uh, so let's talk, well, let's talk about the math a little bit. And yeah. I know I, my wife's like, you don't talk about math, Tom. You don't <laughs> want to talk about math. Well, right? you're, you, you can, you're going to out math me because I'm, I'm not. No, no, no. I, again, I'm not a mathematician, but we can talk about mathematical ideas. So <laughs> it's funny too, because thank God she said that and the editors, like they cut that out of the book. My book, it's a very simple read the book. It's, it's a very simple read. But in any case, I, I started um, when I started become obsessed with math for me, I'm self-taught. Yeah. So, and I lucky enough, my cousin is a mathematics professor and oh, cool. lucky enough, she was sweet enough to indulge me, my, you know, novice teachings. It's not like I have all this information. I remember in the beginning, I sent her this proof. I'm like, this is the most amazing thing ever. She's like, Tom, this is really cool. It's great that you found it, but it was discovered 600 years ago. <laughs> that was great, right? That was so good. I needed that. It, it, I, you know, I was like, okay, all right, fine, good, good, good. Now, uh, I also sent her something else, another proof, another equation. And she said, wow, this is really cool. And it's true. She goes, what would be very helpful, maybe even make it publishable if there was a geometric component to go with it. So I get this back from her. And I'm like, oh, like that's that's like, and and again, I'm like, and this is where I got the idea, the, the, not the idea, the knowledge that I was building something. These are not geographic. It's not sides of a triangle. Right, right. They are points in space. My the 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 equation I came up with are points in space. Not only that, they're fluid points in space. So. Um, the idea, I think Platonists, if I remember this right, their idea that every number had a place and numbers were very real, yeah. what I am doing is got an element to that. Whether I believe that or not really doesn't matter to your point because we can build this and see what it is. We can build this and see how important it is. You know, everyone says you cannot, um, most people can't imagine what a complex number is, what it looks like right? That's not true. I can, I mean, I know exactly how, what it looks like to me, right? I know this, this thing that I'm building is a structure just the same way as um, Buckminster Filler made a structure with his uh, architecture, right? Just like a sphere is a structure, just like a tesseract is a structure. This thing that I'm building is an extreme structure. It's got positions. Um, and, um, and it, to, to your point about the plateness and stuff like that. Yeah. The funny thing is I would have gone there and I would have done the things and I would have gone average on my math test. And they would have said, you know, Tom, this is great. Do something else. <laughs> I yeah. was not the best mathematical student because I didn't care. Let's be honest. I didn't care. No, you know? I didn't either. I, yeah, I didn't okay. understand no. why. Yeah. I'm a way more ideas based person and I didn't, it, it was never communicated to me why I should care. And, yep. and that's what's so interesting is even, you know, not, you don't even have to go all the way back to Plato for this, but back when they taught things with like the, um, in, in the more classical uh, way of education, you know, the, the quadrivium and everything, how, how you, how, how you would learn everything in a complementary way. Like you would see the relationships between math and music. You'd see the relationships between rhetoric and, and logic and all these different things. We, and we, we just don't have that today. Everything is like compartmentalized. It's just like learn this, learn that. And to me, it was like the most boring thing ever. And it wasn't until I became much older that I started to see those interconnections. But yeah, to, to your point, and, and I really think, Tom, this, this could potentially dovetail into a worldview that complements 
what you're experiencing. And because it, it's it's they did believe in in number realism, but it's um, so it's, you, you'll probably love this. So there, you know, the Nobel Prize winning physicist, arguably the most famous physicist still alive, Roger Penrose, he considers himself a mathematical Platonist in that he believes that the platonic realm of mathematical forms is real. And we are when when we're finding um, novel math, we are finding something that already exists, right? Like this isn't something some person is making up in a vacuum. Like if it's really telling us something about the behavior of reality, clearly it's in reality somewhere in some way. And it, it's it's not mathematical notation written up in the sky somewhere, but the mathematical notation is representing something that is real about reality. For, yeah. for real, right? And that it's to that end that the Platonists were were interested in, in math and geometry because they really believe that this stuff exists. And at the highest human faculty, we can train ourselves, we can train our personal logos to pierce into this higher realm of reality. And in this big fat book behind me um, by Penrose, he says the same thing. He says when when we are discovering a mathematical formula or when we're, we're we're working out a proof the human mind is penetrating into this higher level of reality that he calls the mathematical platonic realm of forms and it's mysterious and and we we fundamentally don't know much about it it's like it's like using the limit of what it is to be a human and like shining a flashlight in there logically and rigorously and coming away with something that you can write down on a piece of paper. And he entertains the idea that it may not just be math, like that there may be other things there, but obviously as a highly respected mathematician and scientist, he doesn't want to like go to too many of those places, but you can tell he's leaving the door open. And then you get you start to get into this subjective territory of like well what are the other things that i can experience with that faculty of my mind and and what what else could it be showing me and i think your what you're experiencing is a potential answer to that question of look i'm i'm not just seeing math i'm seeing all kinds of stuff with with potentially that same faculty that we're talking about and that's one of the main reasons i wanted to talk to you because i'm like man this guy really could be experiencing what I've thought about so many times, like, or, or maybe what I've experienced on like psychedelics and stuff like that, but not, not on an everyday basis. So, okay. A couple of things. Let's talk about Penrose. So I'm yeah. going to the consciousness conference in April, um, actually 21st to 27th. He's one cool. of the speakers. Amazing. So it's very cool to see him. So this is where I will, uh, academics can tease me and make fun of me. So I look at Roger Penrose's work, right? And some of it is beyond me, but the images he has, they are very close to what I see. I'm like, so it's so funny when you read a brilliant man, you're like, oh, this is close. I'm like, oh, dude, you can't say this is close. He's way smarter than you. He's way more educated. But I would like to sit down and talk to him and say, you see this, this is how, what I see, and I can show him. Now, there are other mathematical, and that's one of the objects he has in his yeah. book. I don't want to get into the details of it. But there's other objects that we know about. There's a Caleb Yao um, image that physicists love, right? I, there's nothing that I see that looks like that, and I do not understand their fascination with it. We are fascinated, uh, physicists are fascinated with the Taurus. Yeah, that's cool, but there's so many other, there's so many other multidimensional objects, manifolds that I see that are not in any way being studied at all, wow. right? And Penrose has the closest to what I see. Now, I thought that was great. And the way he thinks, absolutely. And I, 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 I agree with him, right? I, if I would love to work, and I, I, Terrence Tao is a Fields Medal winner, right? He's a really smart guy, brilliant man. I get his newsletter. Okay, he sends it out to all these mathematicians. I remember about five years ago, I finally understood he had a class perspective, what undergraduate. I'm like, oh, I know, I get every single thing he's going to be talking about. I have an understanding of that. I was very happy for that moment, right? Um, but he goes to the things that are way beyond my understanding because, you know, I, it, my eyes get glossy just like everyone else when they talk about this stuff. Yeah. That said, there's some things I'm like, hold on a minute, let's, let's come back here. Let's come back here. Right. The idea, the way certain numbers are thought of, we are not the end. We are. Here's what I will say. And I can sit down and prove 
with by my, I mean, I've, I've done this to a degree, but I could sit down. We, everyone says complex numbers are pretty much the end of the numbers as we know them. Mm-hmm. But for the most part, there's other subsets of numbers. There's so many other kinds of numbers out there. The natural numbers, everyone's like, well, that's the starting point. Negative on one side, positive on the other. Hold on a minute. No, that's not what I see at all. Not even a little bit. I see negative numbers here, sometimes negative numbers here. I, and I see it and I can build it. So the numbers that we understand are just a fraction of the numbers that are accessible to uh, the human mind. Um, Now, I have no business writing a paper and submitting that because I have no provenance. That's used we use in art history, but I have no training. It will not be taken seriously. I mean, even George Cantor and uh, Kronecker had a discussion about the Aleph numbers. And they were two professional, brilliant mathematicians, and they couldn't agree on it. Mathematicians mm. couldn't even agree on whether negative numbers were real for the longest time, mm. you know? Yeah. So I have, <laughs> nobody's going to take me serious if I come in at that level. Now, if I come in like this, and people start listening and I sit down, okay, now we're now that may be the that may be the smart thing to do. And I actually did think about it. I'm like, do I want to go back to school and get this degree? I'm like, well, then we're still gonna argue about it. I was like, let's go into let's do what I know I can do, which is upside hundred percent all the time, and it and they will come to me if there's an interest. Yeah. Right? I would think someone would be interested in this ability that you're talking about of being able to like fold and you know, change, like do things topologically like that. I, I mean, that, that seems like something that could easily be done in a, in some kind of experimental setting. And, you know, they sure. could have like the answers and you could be like, okay, then I do this. Then I like, you know, it, it sounds like you could like do literal origami inside your head. Yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah. Wow. And it's funny. They would try to, and I've thought about this too, like the Caleb Yao, if they'd say, let's deconstruct that. I'd be like, no, let's, let's go over here. I, and it would, should be what I'm seeing. They, I, from my perspective, they should be interested in what I'm seeing and how it applies to what they're doing. Because, yeah. you know, let's see if there's something here that that's new to us. And some of the images are new or they're like I said, Penrose has got some that are really close to what I'm seeing. Yeah, very close. And I am I am in awe of that. Have now, you ever seen his sorry to interrupt you. Um, Have you ever seen his tiles like the Penrose tiles? That yeah, he, yeah. This okay. is not that. This okay. is not that. This is more the time cone. This is gotcha. more his time cone that he's got. OK, OK. Um, But let's talk about perspective for a minute, if you don't mind. Yeah, of course. Um, so, and this is something that and everyone can listening, everyone has seen a double rainbow, right? Double rainbow is an illusion of perspective. A person sees it from a different a, a vantage point. You see a smaller rainbow in the middle, typically, which is darker with the rays, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo going towards the center, center or towards the center. I'll say us. I'll say that in a minute. And the other ones are diffused or lighter going away, right? And they're in the, there's a middle... Um, there's a band in the middle that's darkened. Now, that is an illusion of perspective. I can step out of that perspective and get a side view of a double rainbow. Now, there, if let's be clear, there is no side view. A physicist is like, what is he talking about? There is no side view of a double rainbow. However, when I see it from that perspective that does not exist, the inner rainbow is in fact a funnel spinning in this direction, or it's, I shouldn't say it is a funnel, whatever the electromagnetic spectrum is connected to a funnel that is spinning towards the perspective. It gets Mm -hmm. too tight. It gets like a rubber band. It gets diffused. And the other one spinning the other way, going in the other direction. So I think those things are dark matter, dark energy. I know it's not the electromagnetic spectrum. I know it's something else. So it's not two circles on top of each other, one bigger, one far, smaller. It is a funnel from this perspective that does not exist, but that I can still see. So so you're talking about like the individual's point of view experiencing the thing. And and if you, so so is, is the tunnel a sort of, uh, I guess for lack of a better term, like space, like, like a Hilbert, not a Hilbert space, but t- like a type of space through which the individual perceives that's normally invisible to us? But it's like the it's like the sort of um, invisible backdrop of our sure. perception that we can't normally see. Is that what you're getting at? Yeah, yeah. Let's let's talk about that too because it's important. So when I was in the MRI, the second one, I said, "Okay, I'm going to see if I can do upside here, but I will not be able to do it because my brain is it's an electromagnetic spectrum, and these giant magnets are going to." You know, it's like screaming. It won't, I won't have the ability because they, um, yeah. they will get in the way. 
So I'm in there and I'm, and I did it and it was business as usual. No problem. I can do upside in an MRI with giant spinning magnets. Now, if you know anything about physics, which I just don't know a lot, but I know this gravity and magnets, you know, they don't, gravity is not influenced by magnets. So I'm like, wait a minute, is this gravity? Am I literally seeing something that everyone says, you know, we've got these big giant gravity, I don't know what they're called, that measure the waves from far away. And there's also quantum gravity that we can never possibly measure. So I'm like, maybe it's gravity. Or related to gravity. I wrote a blog, blog about it called, um, you know, I think it's gravity. In the meantime, I'm like, wait a minute. There's also something called dark matter and dark energy that is supposed to allow for the unusual rotation of galaxies. Because if we use, if they measure all the m amount of matter in the world, mm -hmm. there's something left over. Yep. And those words are placeholders. Let's be clear. The placeholders of what this is. I have a hypothesis that my eyes are... I used to think it was gravity, just like light is reflecting off matter for me to see. I think the gravitational waves are reflecting off this dark matter for my eyes to pick up. Hmm. I can't prove that now. Obviously, we can't prove it. There's no technology. But these things are, they are, and I do think they're waves. You know, I mean, they're holographic waves that I am picking up. So that is a hypothesis. So to answer the question, I think it is the dark matter, and we'll use it as a placeholder, that still connects with our electromagnetic spectrum or in some way connects. I don't know how. So yes, that's the question is, is it interacting with it? Yes, somehow. And we should talk about DNA too in a minute because I can yeah. see it interact with DNA and I've got some pictures you can put, put up. But um, I do think that there is another element, dark matter, dark energy, a combination of both. We'll call them placeholders, whatever, something else that is interacting with us. And this is why Young and the collective unconscious, the non-locality, they all speak to this. That's mind blowing. And it, it made me, while you were talking, um, it made me think about the strange kinds of inspiration that have led to breakthroughs throughout history. And like, if you, if you go back, you don't actually, you don't even have to go back because obviously people like Tesla and other, other people, even now, like, like Penrose in some way, even are like, talk about that, like whatever they're like, and, and I'll, I'll be, I'm going to be fair. I'm not saying Penrose is saying he's channeling something, but in a sense, he, he believes that he's at least penetrating into some other layer of reality that, that is like this mathematical layer of reality. And another, I guess I want to introduce this idea too, because another idea that comes from Platonism. Um, and when you were talking about that proof that your cousin said that was discovered 600 years ago, I'm like, I thought to myself, well, no problem, because in some ways you're kind of proving another core tenet of Platonism potentially and math being the perfect example of this because what you that story is almost like um what's kind of loosely known as the 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 story of the slave socrates and the slave boy and it's basically socrates is attempting to show that knowledge particularly like these higher kinds of knowledge are not discovered they're remembered in what the greeks called anamnesis and the way that he tried to demonstrate this is he took like this illiterate uneducated little boy who was a slave and and allowed him to solve like a, a geometric theorem without the boy knowing anything and him just asking him like i don't remember what the, all the logical questions were that he asked him but the boy like figured it out for himself and socrates was trying to show like look this he, he's like reading the logical real language of nature through his personal faculties and, and this is very real and it, when you were saying you just you used to rediscover this proof it's it sounds like almost the exact same thing like you stumbled upon the same territory that's really there and you were able to like glean real information from it and to me that's really exciting um but the other thing i wanted to uh bring up oh yeah that in the history of science this is massively dismissed and glossed over and i was talking about this with um Bobby Azarian, who we briefly talked about at the beginning, um, or I think before we recorded, but he's a neuroscientist, very logically rigorous guy, open-minded, but you know he's coming at most of this from a from a harder science, more uh, neuroscience and and academic, I guess, philosophy standpoint as well. Um, but he was even talking about that man when you look into the history of ideas and physics, 
they really do their best to diminish people's spiritual beliefs, religious beliefs. A lot of these really remarkable hit thinkers throughout history were either devoutly religious or had spiritual beliefs. And there's so many to name, but um, I'm working my way through this book by Richard Tardis right now. That's an absolute beast, but it's one of the most important books I've ever read. It's called Passion of the Western Mind. And it goes through like the entire history of of Western thought, all the major thinkers, how thought evolved over time, you know, all the way from ancient Greece to up to the modern era. And there's this insane quote that I had to clip out that I think I'm going to use in a video. But for, I kind of want to read this to you because I think this is going to shine so much light on the idea that, hey, these strange kinds of inspiration coming from who knows where that almost seem like they're being beamed by something or whatever, like that is not a new phenomenon. And let me just, if you'll allow me, read this kind of long quote because I think it's pretty mind blowing. Let's do it. All right. So quote, this is from, so this, again, this is from Professor Richard Tarnas, who wrote the book, Passion of the Western Mind. The esoteric played an indispensable role in modern science. Besides the Neoplatonic and Pythagorean mathematical mysticism and sun exaltation that ran through the major Copernican astronomers, one finds Roger Bacon, the pioneer of experimental science, whose work was saturated with alchemical and astrological principles. Giordano Bruno, polymath esotericist who channeled an infinite Copernican cosmos. Paracelsus, the alchemist who laid the foundations for early chemistry and medicine. William Gilbert, whose theory of the Earth's magnetism rested on his proof that the world soul was embodied in that magnet. William Harvey, who believed his discovery, the circulation of the blood, which is weird because you brought that up earlier. You brought up, you could envision a circulatory system. Um, William Harvey, who believed his discovery, the circulation of the blood revealed that the human body was a microcosmic reflection of the earth's circulatory systems and the cosmos's planetary notions, motions. Descartes' affiliation with the mystical Rosicrucianism, Newton's affiliation with the Cambridge Platonists, and his belief that he worked within an ancient tradition of secret wisdom dating back to the Pythagoreans and beyond, the law of universal gravitation itself modeled by the sympathies of Hermetic, the sympathy of Hermetic philosophy. So it's a giant big net of like, like magnetism, gravity, circulatory system, magnets, like all of this stuff comes out of philosophy and esoteric thinking. It's like it's like interwoven with it. Even like the the people who um as he mentions like Copernicus who, you know, proved essentially heliocentrism and the moving earth and everything. He was like a like a neoplatonist thinker and believed in astrology and all these other things that today we're like, well, hold on. And it's like, well, no, you mm-hmm. hold on because they all believed in this shit, and today we're dismissing it as nonsense, yet our knowledge comes out of these ways of thinking. Yeah, what is that about? I'm really, <laughs> what is the answer for that? It's wild. I don't know. I don't know. But but it does it, 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 these are the kinds of mysteries that I that I come to where I'm like, I don't know the answer, but it actually excites me. Like these are the kinds of answers that I don't have where the question ex- itself kind of excites me more. Okay. All right. Let, let, yeah. This got me thinking. I want to talk about two scientists or uh, mathematicians from the past, but scientists. Okay. So this upside vision, I, I, I wrote a blog called um, dark matter revolution is coming and it's going to make AI look like a middle school science project published it in October 21 on medium. One of the things I talk about is how Leeuwenhoek, when he invented the microscope, right, he saw this smaller world that no one knew what was going on. He saw this. He is the father of microbiology, right? I think I am seeing something like that. Okay, so put that over here. Hertz discovered the radio waves that Maxwell equations hypothesized years earlier, theorized, right? Both of those, those things are related because I think I am seeing a different kind of wave, right? And, and, and I think it is not, and I think it can be explored and studied. My goal, right? My goal of, by the way, there are other people with this. They may not know it or they don't want to talk about it because I actually, I know this because they've reached out to me. Um, with it, whether they have a certain degree of this ability or not, they come forward. My goal is to launch an expedition <laughs> to go into this hidden biosphere and 
categorize and download all this data with a team of scientists, upside visionaries, whatever you want to call it, because it's accessible to us all the time. Now, the question is, is it my bio field, right? Is if I am sitting here, is it like six feet around me? Is if a person six feet around me, are they so completely different? Is it once it's 10 feet out there, are we going yeah. to see the same thing? See, these are the questions that we can look at and measure. Um, so, so for example, if there's another person with upsight sitting next to me, I believe that we would, in fact, be able to see the same things, communicate in this space non-verbally, non-sign language. I believe that for another reason, a number of reasons. One, obviously, I'm communicating with an intelligence out there and it knows what's going on. There's an engagement. Number two, if you want to use a real world example of people having group, let's call it for this discussion, hallucinations. We talked about it earlier. A group of guys are on DMT. They all trip together. They all see the same group hallucination. They're like, and they communicating with it. When they come down, they dismiss it and you can't prove it again. And they're all high and they're, you know, go about their way. But there's anecdotes, many, many right. anecdotes. Yep. I'm in the room with them. I'm the control, no drugs. Everyone, everyone, give everyone a microdose or whatever we need to do. We see the same thing because we're hitting the same frequency um, for our brain states are in the same frequency. Now we know we can communicate. Game changer. Yeah. I mean, right? Game changer. Yeah. How do you get, now, I mean, you can't, <laughs> people can't trick, even Terrence McKenna, he's like, you cannot trip all the time. It's exhausting, you know? Yeah, yeah for it's sure. Like, so, so you had it, you find, I mean, obviously pharmacology or whatever, you can get into that brain state without the side effects of the exhaustion. You know, right now they're talking about trying to do DMT without the hallucinations, just the benefits of the PTSD. I, I don't, don't get that. I think, they're <laughs> missing the boat. <laughs> I think they're missing the boat. My point is talking about these things, I, obviously as my, as a, as a, just a, uh, hobbyist researcher, I see pieces that relate to me and I'm trying to put them all together to figure out what the hell's going on. And you said that earlier, Michael, and that is exactly what I'm doing, um, what I'm doing now. It's exciting. And, and yeah, that, I mean, that's kind of like this holy grail idea, right? That if we could somehow prove that we can all have this altered experience state together or altered perception state together and prove that we're seeing the same thing that would be this like holy grail kind of experiment. And I got to tell you, this might actually be happening. So I have a friend who, um, brilliant guy, uh, his name's Alexander Biner, wrote a book called The Bigger Picture. But he's kind of like me, like he, he explores all this stuff from a um, multidisciplinary point of view, does a lot of work on himself, has done a lot of work with, you know, meditation, psychedelics, um, but it's also just re really well-read, really smart guy. Um, and I don't mean to say that he's like me in that respect. Um, <laughs> he, I, he, he, wrote the, he wrote a book that I wish I could have wrote. But anyway, he was able to get into the world's first extended state DMT study at Imperial College London, where they hook you up to the same kind of IV drip that you would go to under surgery, and they give you continuous long lasting DMT. So for people that don't know, typically in a recreational setting, if you vaporize DMT, it's a very explosive experience and very short lasting. It's, you know, it, your, your brain essentially just recycles the molecule out very quickly. So it's like 15 minutes at that at most. But people have theorized, you know, like, well, what if we put it in a, in an IV drip and you could just keep it going indefinitely and keep it going, keep it going. So they did that pilot study at Imperial College London. He was in it. And he told me last time we talked, and this is on a podcast we did, that he's like, I can't say much about this right now, but we're going to do a study that involves multiple people and potentially kind of mapping the space or like at least ascertaining if the phenomenology is similar. Like if you tell me, you know, under this exact dose, look down, look right, look left. What are you seeing? What's happening? How much similarity how much exact overlap is there? So I don't know the design of the study. I don't know 100% that this is happening, but he made it sound like this is happening and he's going to be on that team as we're part of that as well. So it could be closer than we think. Um, who knows what the results are going to be, but I'm 
incredibly interested in what that's going to lead to. Yeah, me too. 100%. That's the kind of thing I would absolutely find online and read every bit of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Because that that is almost one of those things where if they prove that we can do that, reality itself, you know, there, there, there's even for me, like as somebody who's had, I'm so interested in all of these things. I've had life altering experiences with tryptamines. Like I, I'm, I'm a Kool-Aid drinker. Okay. But even for me, I don't know if for certain that this is not all just the function of my brain and neurochemistry. I don't like, I don't think it is. And I, and honestly, I have a bias toward not really wanting it to be. I want to believe we live in a more mysterious situation than we can reduce down to, to materialistic bits. And, and I think we do, but I don't know that. However, if we can prove that in a study, how would you ever explain that being completely endogenous or just the product of just really fancy electricity and meat brain arrangements like that it's, it really seems like you're proving at that point that there is some kind of external reality that we can tap into or or um at least sense of some other layer of reality that we normally have access to that's that's real and that we're all can travel it together like if, if man if, if we prove that that's going to be an ontological landmine that I that I will that I kind of hope gets stepped on personally. Well, you know, it's funny too because um, from a philosophy. So I, I, I sometimes I'll do a, a a mind game like, what if Daniel Dennett or David Chalmers or anybody had this right? Yeah. What would their worldview change? Right? Would your deterministic worldview change? If you had that, or would it become more entrenched? Right? right. Would your free will change? Now, here's the funny thing. <clears throat> um, as much as I talk about synchronicity, and I, I, there's this kind of a precog element of things that are going to happen. I kind of know some certain things are going to happen. Not all the time, just enough where it's annoying, like frustrating, right? I'm not going to plan anything on something I may see. And a lot of things I may see never happen. But there's an element of, well, if it's de that means it's determined, right? It means that I don't have the free will. But I am under the illusion still, even though with the synchronistic things that I do have the free will, ish. Yeah. 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 That's, right. I, I, me too. That, that's where I'm at too. Like that, I, I believe that we have a requisite or, or, or at least a, an, a, an amount of free will that operationally matters. Like you can give me all of these complex arguments about determinism and like, like, I mean, some arguments about determinism go all the way back to the big bang, right? Like as soon as the laws of physics were set in motion, in some sense, like what every bit of matter for the rest of eternity, it was all kind of settled in that moment. Like, to me, all of those arguments require that you dispose of the most important factor for the counter argument, which is the reality of the human psyche or the reality of the human soul or whatever you want to call it. Like th those arguments always hinge on that being an illusion or not being real. And as soon as you take that away, sure, now you can just reduce everything down to, to physics and, you know, chemistry and things that we have no control over. But yeah, I, I'm not going to relinquish the psyche or the soul that, that easily personally. I still, I still think, and, and, and also I would argue that even if you did do away with that and you could predict what I was going to do 99 times out of a hundred, that 1% actually still matters quite a bit because I could make a life altering decision yeah. and the decision tree of my entire life then changes, you know, based on that one strange decision I made. So I, I just, I just don't understand how. No, I like that. And it's funny too, because I have upside vision has shown me what the big bang looked like in the beginning and how it's evolved. Right. So I, and now, but let me say something too about upside. It shows it's, there's this trickster element. It always doesn't show the truth. So a lot of times it will just show me absolute nonsense, things that are just not, I know they're not real, right? I've come to learn and believe that the things that repeat themselves and I see again and again that are see the same way, those are, tend to be real. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, the, so, you know, we have the picture of astrophysicists have the picture of the big bang. It's like big bang. And then eons, it's one way, right? They, they're like this, this, and all the light years that, I mean, I, maybe they know this and I don't know why they show us that if they do know it, but it's weird to me because it's not the, the, the universe beginning from what I see is not like that at all. It doesn't go one way. It goes in many ways. It's almost like a seed 
that sprouts in many directions in a tree. There's some mm. here and there's some below the ground. The universe from the upside perspective is very much like that. Mm. And if something is a billion years this way, there's something could be a billion years that way too. They're both a billion years old, right? But they grew from this, I'll call it a seed. It's not a seed from this middle part. So, but this, even though billion years this way, billion years this way, they're, they're not two billion. You know what I mean? This is not, even though they're 2 billion years apart for lack of another, it's not 2 billion years old. Now they may know this, but if they do know it, they need to give better pictures for the general reader to understand this stuff, yeah. right? If they're going to do stuff like that. Now here's something really funny. Let's talk about physics for a minute. Cause this is something that is Okay, this is something that Upside shows me time and again. So, you know, they're in CERN, they're pushing these big things yeah, together yeah. and they're they're knocking them into each other to see that, um, to find out secrets of the universe. Upside literally shows me, don't do that. That's like crashing Mercedes into each other to figure out how to build a Mercedes. Maybe, maybe the idea is to get close so they don't touch each other and maybe keep them like butter, like keep getting them close, spinning past each other very close without touching and something will come from that. Now, mm -hmm. that, obviously that is just something it shows me. I'm not a physicist at all, um, but that it, interests me. It's like something that can be studied and like, and yeah, they may be doing this too. Maybe they're like way ahead. Again, they, they could have been doing this for 20 years, but it's interesting that it will show me things like that, that I should not have any interest or concern in. But all of a sudden I'll be sitting outside the CERN facility that'll go in and it, it'll show the one thing and then it'll like, and then it will show it, you know, spinning past each other, getting close. And it's like, this is something they should try or you should try mm. whatever. So th those are the kind of weird things that, you know, yeah. inexplicable. Why is that? They know I'm not, or they, who's they, they this, I'm not over there. So anyways. Yeah. yeah it, it really sounds to me, Tom, and, and I don't, I don't mean this could sound dismissive but if you if you're talking about this from like the jungian perspective it's not dismissive at all it almost sounds to me that like the way that you talk about it having this mercurial kind of quality to it where it, it could be profound and seem real or trickstery or dark or and, and it's something that you can interact with but it's also doing something outside of your awareness it, it really almost sounds like dream intelligence or dream dream world like Whereas most people have no access to that mode of consciousness when they're awake, it almost sounds like whatever that is, the unconscious, the, I mean, if you want to try to boil it down to some, I don't even know what you'd boil it down to in materialism, like what part of the brain that we're not conscious of that would be or whatever. It almost seems like you're able to use all of those faculties while awake or something because dream, like the only other thing I can think of that encompasses all of that it is something like a like a, a collective unconscious that can, I, I guess or a personal unconscious which is could sort of be like the microcosm of that respective macrocosm in that it does contain everything right it contains all like all of this knowledge that you're normally not aware of it could be dark it could be light it, it could be archetypal it could be mathematical it could be anything and it, it just sounds to me like somehow you're aware of that somehow or can tap into that. Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, it, it does feel like that. There's an element to that. And, you know, we were talking about earlier about how it how this interacts, this hidden biosphere interacts yeah. with our real world environment. So I told you about the illusion or the perspective of the double rainbow. I see the D, our DNA strand. Everyone knows the double helix. Right. And they're doing all kinds of cool things with CRISPR and how they cannot edit it and stuff like that. I see this, these elements that have nothing that you don't see with the naked eye and they're not here. They're invisible. It's almost like going back to the Lee Winnicker thing, looking through a microscope. I see this ring around the DNA strand, right? This, and it's, and on that ring is candy cane hooks, right? I see this happening all the time. And I see a stream of energy running through the DNA right? You can't see that with a, with a naked eye. If a geneticist is like, what is he talking about? These are all fair comments they should have. But I feel like I, I, I'm going to compare myself to Leonardo da Vinci. I feel like when Leonardo drew the helicopter, right? Mm -hmm. He drew it 400 years before we knew anything about flight. I think yeah. I'm, I, this could be that far ahead. Um, I don't have any drawing skills, but do you know what I'm saying? I feel like I feel like this is so far ahead. I even think this is ahead of some of the things I'm seeing now, and that may be way, way ahead. But something is going on at that level, which means it's influencing us at a level we know nothing about. Now, 
Um, I don't know what it is. I do know this. When I see those things happen, there's a before. There's the element that I've drawn a picture of. You can put it up on screen when you post this. And there's something that helps that happens after. And it's like when the um, cell splits from one to two to four to six, to, you know, it keeps splitting mm -hmm. to a human or, a, or a, um, a frog or whatever. When somebody says, I have upside vision and I can see this, my question, and this can only work a few times. Okay, what happens next? Right. If we're seeing the exact same thing, they're going to say, oh, this is what happens when they hit it. I'm going to be like, wow, OK, now we both seeing the same thing. It's the idea that we're seeing the same thing. And it's not just a collective. You know, we're talking about the word consciousness. Right. Right. They haven't even defined that. Right. Right. If we're if we use like if we're seeing that, that means it's a biosphere. That means something is interacting with us at our uh, at the human level, you know what I mean? It interact against with a 3d matter level. And that's yeah. kind of a little bit of a, it's not the same thing. That means we can explore it, look at it, dissect it, measure it, or eventually consciousness is the whole awareness thing. And, and it's, I mean, I guess it's related, but as I said earlier, well, because you can do this, you don't know anything, everything. And in fact, it's, it's like, there's more questions. There's not oh, like, yeah. oh, wow, I mean, you would think, wow, I can do this. I'm so amazing. It's like, oh, wow, I can do this. It is amazing. Yeah. And I am in awe, but just so many more questions. A hundred percent. Yeah. Even, even in my own way with experiences that I've had, like I said, even like just ayahuasca retreats or like requisite doses of, of whatever, like it, some people, I guess, walk away from those experiences thinking they know everything or they like they've solved life's mysteries. That is not what happens to me. To me, it just blows open the Mysterium <laughs> Tremendum, the Mysterium Fascinosum that much more. And I'm left with so many more questions about, you know, like there's that Robert Anton Wilson. He's not the one who made it up, but you know, he talks about that phenomenon of the chapter, the chapel perilous that you can go through any of these experiences like that we're talking about, the experience you're having, the experience I'm having, the experiences anyone else has ever had, and they're all happening within the confines of your personal con or um umwelt, right? And you can't remove yourself from that. So at the end of the day, that's what this Chapel Perilous idea is getting at, is like, I've had all these experiences, but it's all been within my individual consciousness. So I don't know if it's my consciousness or it's my consciousness interacting with something out there. I Like, it's all it may all be in there or it may all be out there or it may, you know, we just don't know. And having any experience doesn't, it can lead you to be, to suspect something about reality, but we also know human, you know, um, witnessing is not a great reliable source of ascertaining. Like you told me that you started getting into Donald Hoffman a little bit. Um, if we want to go all the way that direction, then it's like we're literally perceiving 0% of reality with our senses. So what is reality then? But yeah, this this notion of the, the hidden what you call biosphere or this hidden layer of reality that is somehow cut off from our waking consensus reality style consciousness you know, again, this has so many overlaps with so many ideas, many of them we've already talked about. But it's been around essentially forever. And I think as, an, as a result of the scientific revolution and the sort of expungement of anything that has a whiff of esotericism or supernatural to it, we've, we've essentially erased that idea from, from any serious quote unquote conversation, right? But now with the emergence of thinkers like Donald Hoffman, who are literally talking about a realm of conscious agents probably being more real, not more real than physical reality, but being the reality that underpins the illusion of physical reality in his case. Um, though admittedly he is more extreme than your average cognitive scientist, but also like there are tenured professors who are panpsychists. There are like brilliant people who are idealist philosophers out there. Like, you know, again, Hoffman, Bernardo Castro. I've had many of them on the show. These ideas are starting to come back, I think, under new, I was going to say more sophisticated, but in a lot of a lot of senses, it's it has been sophisticated and nuanced. Like the Platonists were pretty fucking sophisticated, but I think it's starting to enter back into the conversation in a way 
that is impossible to ignore, but is also extremely inconvenient for the prevailing <laughs> worldview. Like the prevailing <laughs> worldview and, and these ideas, they're, it's like they're on a collision course with each other. It's like, I don't have upside, but I can see them on a collision yeah, course yeah. with one another. And it's like one is gaining steam and the other, I think, is kind of weakening. And I really think that materialistic, reductionist, um, you know, high-minded kind of science, it, it really looks like it's breaking up in the atmosphere to me of of whatever this higher truth is. And I don't know how they're going to come together, but I, I they're going to have to. Well, people, well, here's the, you know, what's going to have to happen, or I don't, maybe it won't, maybe it'll just die off is people are going to have to change their worldview. These scientists yeah. that are entrenched in their philosophers, scientists, whatever you want to call them, or all of them are going to have to just die off. And it's like, okay, we're going to go in another direction. So people are pig headed and PhDs, mother of God. I mean, come on. If one academic, this is one of the funniest things I, I've, it's, it's actually very funny as an observer. Yeah, it's clearly not funny if you're a PhD, but if you were a PhD in physics and you want to enter the PhD in medicine and have ideas, oh my God, forget it. It's like it's like guarding their territory and the 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 loss of logic and the arguments just break down because they don't. This person over here doesn't know it, but he, they they sound silly. And you're like, yeah. this is my domain. They're basically, so we've already thought of all that. <laughs> right. It's like, okay, I'm like, have you? Have you though? You know? Yeah. Um, so th inconvenient. That's literally a very good and very subtle way to put it. But the idea that there is material, I don't I don't know how you could hold on to that idea, honestly, at this point. You know, the whole materialist idea. Um, I, I just don't know, but but it doesn't matter. Something is changing. Let's talk a little bit about the communication element, if you want to. Yeah. So when I am in this space, right, things, beings show up. There is, first of all, there's an intelligence that does not have a face that I'm communicating with and that's mm. guiding me, mm. right? Sometimes when I'm in this space, I see holographic images of creatures and beings, right? Um, and I watch them the same way I would walk into a forest and watch a bunny hop around or a squirrel climb a tree or maybe a fox, something you can't see. This, I see these type of beings, silhouettes, again, holographic in this space. Now, that is incredible, right? And sometimes these beings look back and we make eye contact. Now, I don't know what I look like in holographic form, <laughs> but I imagine, I actually, I don't know. I imagine maybe it's just me and hologram. Maybe it's like a shadow. Hoffman uh, talked about that. You know, if there's a, you're shining a light, maybe there's a, just a silhouette of me. I don't know. But I know this, when it happens, it's awe-inspiring and it's amazing. And um, sometimes there may be a communication of exchange of thought. Sometimes it's not. It's a lot of times it's just going, something goes about its business. But there is, there is another, there is a non-human intelligence on this planet with us that we dismiss. I don't want to say at our peril, but we dismiss it and we should not. It's, we should not. Have you ever, let me, let me give you this. Have you ever talked to the machine elves? Have you ever seen the machine elves while you were tripping? Have you had seen anything like that? I for sure. I mean, I've definitely had experiences of things appearing to me that are like faces or are seem like they're little mischievous creatures. Oh, yeah, 100 percent. And I've had like very scary, very difficult experiences I've I've talked openly about and many that are just cartoony, like like sad, almost like just I, I can't like this is straight up Saturday morning cartoons, weird type shit. That feels like I'm just like, I just like turned a channel on a TV and like, now I'm watching this. Okay. Like yeah. it's, it's that, it can be that kind of an experience. Yeah. So that's funny you say that. So, you know, there's a, there's something called Charles Benet syndrome that people with macular degeneration, when they're going mm -hmm. blind, they start hallucinating, right? They're losing their sight, but the brain for whatever reason starts hallucinating. My, I think the brain is screaming and saying, listen, your tip, your normal vision is going bad, but we can still see things. And a lot of the things, the reason I'm bringing this up is a lot of things these people see are cartoons. They're cartoony. Mm -hmm. And, and they're like that. They're like Saturday morning cartoons. Now, two things happen when this, and people that have this, they think they're going mad. They go to a doctor and they get diagnosed with this. 
my point number one is the brain sees more than with just the eyes. You know, it's the most evolved part of the brain, but there's some things going back there, obviously, that can see. Yeah. I shouldn't say obviously. I think they can see like third eye. There you go. The third eye thing. Now, there's two ways they deal with that. Some people take drugs so they don't have the hallucinations. But there's other people that have this uh, Charles Benet syndrome. They engage them. And they just deal with them because they know, even though we call it a hallucination, that's not the right word. It's a hallucination. You think it's real and it's scary. They know they're cartoons and there's something, a, a phenomena of the brain or something. Um, but that is still, I, I don't know. I don't know. In that case, is it coming from the brain? Is it projecting right. out here and they're seeing it? Or is it tuning into some radio station that's playing cartoon? <laughs> right, right. Cartoon images and they're tuning in. So the reason, it's because it, it's a little piece of that with upside, right? I don't. I know I'm, once I, once I engage it, I know it's out there. I have to, my eye has to focus on it. Same way you focus on a bird flying. You're like, oh, what's that? And I follow it. Then once I'm engaged, there's a, there's an intelligence from, not from time to time, all the time that you might have to go back and forth where you do have to go back and forth with. So there's something going on in the planet that, um, from a philosophical perspective, from a physics perspective, that we should probably start paying attention to a lot more than we are. I don't know if it's because of climate change. I don't know if we're just going through one of these cycles I talk about. I don't know. But I know, obviously, for me, it's been real. This shift within me has been real. And I, as I said earlier, I'm not the only one. Other people are saying, I have this. I get on the, I get on a Zoom call. Very few have it to the degree I do, but there's a woman that I'm going to meet in the next 60 days. Um, and I, like I said, I want to see if we can see the same thing in the same space. Even if it doesn't work, it doesn't mean it's not going to work. It just doesn't, means it didn't work then. We might have to, you know, I don't know what we'd have to do. But I'm just, we're going to try it. We could try that in a coffee shop. That's science. I'm going to get a coffee shop with this woman in Virginia. If it happens, great. I mean, obviously, if we're really going to do it, we'll have to do it under scientific observation. But if we can do it there, we can do it in a lab. Just like I told Ions, listen, I can come out there. Promise you, you don't have to wait. I always just have to turn my attention and it's there. Yeah. So, yeah. But there's other intelligent things around us that we should, we can learn from. Yeah. Yeah, I think that there is, at the very least, something about the human experience that makes it seem that way. That you absolutely, like, I don't, like, you know, let, go, let's go back to our buddy Terrence McKenna. I don't have to tell you this. Like, all you have to do is, in, in most people's cases, like, you don't need to do this, but in most people's cases, all you need to do is ingest a little bit of certain types of molecules and your perception of reality will fundamentally change. And it's not as simple as you're just under the influence of drugs. Someone I'm acquainted with that a lot of people who have looked into this stuff, Dr. Andrew Gallimore, uh, neuropharmacologist, he, he's one of the people who's been around the internet the most talking about DMT. Even if you're going to talk about it from a neurochemical and, um, I don't know, neuroscience perspective, we don't understand how the brain is building its model of reality. And not only do we not understand that, we don't have a fucking clue how it's possible that you take something like DMT or you take a heroic dose of mushrooms and suddenly your brain begins modeling this wildly alien geometric, like who, like just almost where anything can happen. It's, it's hugely emotional. It's hugely somatic. It's like a full being type of experience. That's very intense and very profound. And for a lot of people, very therapeutic and to dismiss any of that is like, Oh, it's just this, or it's just that it's not just anything. Like we don't have a clue what it is. And I, I personally am way warmer to the idea that that you're on to, that we do live in this ecosystem, that we do live in a much larger, more dynamic reality than we can sense. Because again, to Donald Hoffman's point, for people who don't know who he is, I'm sorry we keep bringing him up, but he's becoming this very famous cognitive scientist who really believes that sensorily speaking, we're, we're not seeing reality. We're seeing a essentially a simplified, a far simplified something. What He always uses the, the computer desktop analogy, that there really is no book icon on your desktop. There really is no picture. It's all code. It's all layers of things you can't see. 
he thinks re- the reality that we live in, quote unquote, is like that. And I suspect that when you are ingesting these things or when you go through something like Tom went through, you're gaining ability to see into some of these layers of reality that we don't normally have the ability to see. And some of it may be, again, these like nebulous, like this is one of the things I love about Jung is is he really tries to change your thinking. Like, because what I was about to say is that you could be seeing something like the collective unconscious or the unconscious. And most people would be like, oh, that kind of makes sense. You know, he's just seeing the unconscious. But when you read Jung, you start to realize, and he calls it the mundus imaginalis, by the way, the, the, um, this like imaginal world, basically. And when you read Jung, you start to realize, hey, this is just as real as our waking reality. It's it's different, but it's also real. It doesn't mean that, you know, in that realm, if I see a train that it's going to run me over, but it doesn't also preclude that train from being real in another kind of sense that really matters. And it doesn't, and, and there is this weird relationship between the two that sometimes does seem permeable, sometimes not. And I don't know what to, I mean, I don't know what to make of that, but I, again, it's one of these questions and th- elements of reality that I agree with you. We definitely can't ignore it. And I think we're beginning to ignore it at our own peril and our own limitation because at least haphazardly, I think we've sort of tied a link in this conversation between whatever that is and the moving forward of human consciousness, of technology, of understanding, of mathematics. And it seems like in almost every single case, those things, like all those people I listed, for instance, like a who's who of like foundational scientific thinkers, all were tapped into this or thinking about this or reading this stuff. And I don't think you can dismiss it. No. And, you know, so the the the, the Hoffman talked about, he, he said something that stuck with me because I oh, I've thought about this a lot. And it's funny. You talk about the a Planck scale, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you th- talk about a Planck scale, it's so small, not 10 to the minus 33, whatever it is, there's yeah. nothing smaller than that that's measurable. Now, from my perspective, something happens if you're down that small. Now, and he's not, he's thinking about the waves or he talks about the waves because that's after something happens, but something, there's a liminal state. Something has to happen when you get down there. Maybe it's like water to ice to mm-hmm. gas, but mm-hmm. something is going to happen when you get down there. Now, why do I think that? Because sometimes while I'm doing upside, I, I'm shown things like that. Um, there's also, and I'm going to touch on a couple of things here. There's a book called Flatland. It was written in 18 something or other. And it talks about how 2D, uh, a two dimensional beings would react with the three dimensional world. Mm -hmm. And there's a a video called, there's a Captain Quantum or something and talks about Flatland. There's a great video that represents how a three dimensional being would freak out a two dimensional being because a two dimensional being is talking to something above them. Right. Mm -hmm. So, Mm -hmm. I'm setting the stage for we live in this 3D world. This upsite um, is 4D plus. Now, when I think about it from, I don't think about it from above necessarily. It definitely is above, but there's another so fascinating element. And you made me think about it because you talked about a train coming towards you. I could literally engage with upside now and I could watch a holographic train come towards me and pass through me. It would go right by, I, I don't, I mean, it could startle me even, no joke, but I know it's not going to kill me, but this holographic image, of their, maybe their quantum waves or whatever is going to go, go through me. At the same time, and this is where I think the, we talk about four dimensional spaces, how to define that. The, the def, for me, what makes the four dimensional, fourth dimensional space, you see a typical tesseract, they show the, the cube with the extra parts of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's good, but there's more than that because in the four-dimensional space, the f- space itself is always changing shape. So oh, it's wow. shrinking. So it's not just that it is a four-dimensional space, but what that space does. When we take a ball and I throw it to you, I'm taking a th- an object in three dimension. It's going to you. You're catching it and it's passing through you know, air and we're measuring it time. It takes one second to get there. What about when space moves through space? You know what I mean? That's yeah. what I'm seeing. And I don't have yeah, answers. I'm just telling you. Well, yeah, well, I'm just telling you that is what I'm seeing. And it makes yeah. me think a lot about it and it makes my head hurt. 
Yeah. Well, that makes me think <laughs> of like really happening. That makes me think of like a Mandelbrot hard zoom, right? Like that our our brains cannot like the Mandelbrot fractal w- wasn't discovered that long ago. I, Wait, that's I, right behind you. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. 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 But if you watch a Mandelbrot hard zoom, like the the zoom in, how it just you know, you can you can just dedicate all the computing yeah. power of your computer to just like continuously zoom into this fractal structure that will always change. Yet we fully understand the mathematics of what it is and the yeah. mathematical rules that govern it. So you can model it. So it, it's that's one of the most mind bending things, at least to an idiot like me in terms of mathematics, that like we have the ability to mathematically express things that are far beyond our understanding or our ability to ascertain, but we can also demonstrate them to be real, like a Mandelbrot fractal. And what's and what's wild about Mandelbrot fractals is clearly so many things in nature are governed by that overarching rule, whatever you want to call it, are expressing that macro cosmic platonic form of math or whatever, like flowers and, you know, everybody has, has seen this stuff. Um, and I mean, yeah, maybe maybe like the negative space of that you're talking about of the fourth dimension that's always changing is just like governed by some rule like that. But we have no way of seeing it. So we just we don't know. Well, you know, it's funny in this mathematical idea. So the, the, the fractal you're talking about stays the same at scale. It's I think they call it scale invariant. I, there's this there's some of the some of the mathematical objects I found one of them blows my mind it, you can let's say you start with a square number four and you can add a constant number let's say it's four plus 19 and we'll take you to the next square which is nine and then 19 again it'll take you to the next square which is 16 nine again or whatever the number is take the next square but I've done this so much there's and this blows my mind now. There's one I can add a constant number to get to the next square. And it's not the next square in a sequence. It's another, it's a certain amount of squares. But one of the times when I do it, it jumps two square numbers. The same constant, but it doesn't go to the next one. It goes two more. And it I can't figure it out. And I'm like, I'm like, wow. And then, it, then it gets constant again. So it's, I think, I don't know what's happening. And I think when I present it to, I, and I'm, part of me is like, okay, somebody with better mathematical skills said, here's your error. And it's mm-hmm. going to be a very simple fix. But the other part of me thinks something extraordinary happening when the scale changes, the mathematical scale changes, it's obviously, and it jumps to another scale. And that's yeah. what's happening. Like something right? is like emergent. Something is, yeah. Something yeah, is like emergent. emergent new. Perfect yeah. word for yeah, this. Yeah. An emergent yeah. phenomena of the mathematical model I'm using. Um, I don't have an answer. And I, I, yeah. that's, that's been bugging me for 10 years. <laughs> something <laughs> something was- about it's crazy because talking so now we're getting into this realm of like who knows what the fuck we're talking about woo in it but it's fun um so yeah to to continue this analogy of like a 2D creature interacting with a 3D creature right like there there is like a like a 2D straight line or a 2D plane versus a having a three dimensional space like we human beings would live in we can imagine that lower level of reality. Like if you've ever played a 2D side-scrolling video game, like you, it's easy to imagine. But what the human brain really struggles with is trying to go up another dimension. And I'm not talking about like 5D in the sense of like, you know, Pleiadian new age stuff. I'm talking about like actually like, uh, like adding another plane mathematically onto your feet, your, your, your brain doesn't function like that, at least unless you're talking about in the highest platonic mathematical <laughs> sense. Like your senses do not function like that. Like your none of our senses function in that kind of a realm. So we have a very difficult time understanding what it would mean to be a fourth dimensional creature or anything beyond that. And then when you start to even entertain the idea that these beings could and probably do exist. Like, why wouldn't they exist? Then you have to ask the impossible to answer question of what would it be like to interact with one of those beings? And I don't know. I mean, maybe it would be something like an anomalous UFO type encounter. Maybe it would be something like a crazy psychedelic experience where the thing can change its appearance it can appear to you as an emotion. It can appear to you as a color. Can, like, I don't know. I don't know. But when you when you start to open that can of worms, the the brain 
bristles at that kind of an idea, almost like the idea of infinity or something. It's like, I, I don't know. It's just too big. I, I, it's not possible for me to understand because you're really, because you're talking about like exactly what you're talking, you were talking about with math, where there's like this emergent level where the structure changes now. And there is, we, we know there's that below us for sure. So it's probably above us and there's probably things that exist in whatever that is. Yeah. You know, it's funny too. The, the, so you're talking about be- above or below. And when I started working on this mathematical model, it was in front. And this is weird. The, the language is important. It's extraordinarily important. It was in front of and behind. So I was f- building this mathematical model and I was going towards it, like consider it like a horizon line. Yeah. Right. I'm going towards this thing. And Fortnite's a big game. You know, you get mm-hmm. to the center. Right. So and then I would think about the numbers that were behind me and my brain couldn't wrap its head around it. So it's funny. I could not. I was like, you know what? That's too hard. This is freaking hard. That's just forget it. That's AI. That's next level hard. And I was like, OK, we'll worry about that later. It will take care of itself. <laughs> Yeah, but I needed right. to go this way. So once I once I got to the center, I was done. I'm like, okay. So what, the reason I say 5D plus, you say above, but I'm going to say behind. And I think it's really, really interesting that we're yeah. using this kind of languages because it's not the same thing. Right, I think right, they're right. both right. I think they're both right, but they're not the same thing. It, um, to- yeah, really important. Because yeah, if you're talking about a higher dimension, it's here. Like it's not above or something. It's like it's literally here, but in a way that we can't perceive. Right. People say smaller dimensions folded up. That's that's helpful. Definitely. That's helpful. Um, as far as the non-human intelligence, these cr- there are gr- the traditional grays. If you want to talk about the gray, I don't even I, 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 I talk about this on other podcasts. Yeah. Um, but when I was seeing this, I've seen those gr- beings in holographic form. Without a doubt, I've seen those great beings. And um, people call themselves star seeds and they say they're getting downloads. I have no reason to not believe them. Because of what's happened to me. So I am, You. some people say you're credulous. Maybe I'm going to give people a lot of leeway because what I'm doing and seeing and have gone through is extraordinary. If somebody that's happening to them, why won't I believe them? My point is that's not happening to me. Right. Okay. <laughs> I'm not getting that messages from anything, but I am seeing things yeah. like that, right? And I am observing things like that. And that in itself is extraordinary. Um, and, and, you know, hard for some people to accept. But if you pay attention to the news, there, everyone knows something is going on or maybe not everyone. Maybe people are dismissive. I know something. Let's put it this way. I know something is going on. I have no insider information. I have no information other than what I can glean when I am surfing the organic metaverse or when I am on an expedition through this hidden biosphere. I pick up things. And again, I've got a dozen years of stuff that I've picked up. Some of it should be intellectual property. Some of it I'm just holding on to for the time to be right. Um, and that's coming. But right now I want to connect. I want to find out what somebody else has is just like me. I want somebody, I want, this is, the, this is the dream. Somebody that can do what I do, but has a subject matter expert, a geneticist with upside, um, uh, a brilliant mathematician with upside, an astrophysicist with upside, quantum physicist with upside. And then it's, then it's like, forget it. Sky's the limit, man. Yeah, and, I think so cool. and I think, and I think, it's an evolutionary step. I think what happened to me is a mutation. We talked about the drugs and stuff, but I think something was upregulated in my genes. Maybe I did it, stress, whatever, whatever drugs, but something cha- obviously changed. Um, and I'm seeing more. I think people also might have this or a version, but their parents said, don't say that. You're going to be crazy. Or even as, yeah. a, as an adult, you know, I don't forget. I'm not talking about it. I'm not engaging it. I'm hoping somebody starts realizing, or maybe somebody has been sitting on this for years and they're like, Oh, now I can talk about it. Somebody else is the punching bag, you know, the guy in front. And um, I'm okay with that. (laughs) (laughs) I am totally okay with that. Well, let, let's get to some of the, the weirdest shit you've experienced because I, I think we've hopefully done a good job of demonstrating that we're coming at this from a nuanced perspective. We don't know what's going on. However, I know you have had some pretty crazy experiences because, you know, as you've said, you can interact with this. You can be a player in this. You can try to follow things. You can try to travel this space. And I know traveling this space, you've had some really weird experiences with things that seem like extraterrestrials or seem like 
higher uh, life forms. And I've heard I've heard that story where you where you came upon what felt like gray aliens. Um, would love to hear that story again, or if you have any other ones too that you've. No, let me let's tell that one because, like I said, it's perfect for this audience. I, hopefully, we've built some credibility on um, on what is happening. Certainly, know that I'm seeing something right now. So, I'm going to tell the story. When I started doing this, oh wait, wait, actually, let's talk about is up. I, I wrote a blog for Ions Ions oh. Noetics Institute. It's called Is Upside B- Ability. Uh, is upside a psychic ability? And the answer I say is yes, right? And then I talk about telepathy, uh, precognition, remote viewing, and um, something else. I can't remember. It doesn't matter. I talk about why it's that thing. So what happened is when when I first started doing this, I would sit in there and one time, I mean, I would sit and just look, look off, astral projection. That's the other one. I would just look off and watch it. One time I'm literally just traveling through Upsite, however it is, and I stumble upon this ship filled with gray aliens, right? There are a dozen of them. They're standing in a circle. Remember, holographic form, one color tint, that kind of stuff. And they're looking down at what looks like a glass table, right? And I'm looking and I'm getting closer to them. And I realize it's not an empty glass table at all. It is their remote viewing a town with people in it walking around. And I'm looking closer and I realize they're working as a chorus. The the person that was in one gray's field of vision with their big eyes, when it would left this gray's field of vision, the neck gray next to it would have to pick it up or it seemed like have to. Yeah. But they were all working as a chorus. I don't know if they were remote viewing that town, I don't know if they were influencing what they were looking at. All I know, they were hyper, they were hyper paying attention at it. And I also knew that they all had a part to play in creating this 360 degree view of this town in the U S somewhere with the people walking through it. Again, don't know what they were doing. I just watched what they were doing. When this happened (laughs) while I'm doing it, I'm looking two of the grays turned they paid it. They looked at me, right? Made eye contact with me, and I'm like, "Huh? Can they see me?" Right? And yeah. They started coming towards me. Boom! I'm done. I'm like, "Okay, this is scary. I'm out." So that was one of the first times I realized I am not only in this space navigating it, but this space has intelligent beings that can see me. And when you're in there and they can see you, I mean, it's a different thing. You know, there's an exchange of information. Now, most, don't, 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 let's be clear. Most of the time, whatever I'm interacting with, let's call it the universe or some hidden knowledge, maybe it was a hidden part of my brain. Mm-hmm. It's not always like that, but it is sometimes like that. And I've had other instances with the grays. Um, again, not usually to communication, but they're, from my perspective, they're kind of a nuisance, Right. Sometimes I'd be working on the math and they would just get there and then be a nuisance. So I don't know what their purpose with. There's so many people that are study this as a career, as a job. They take it very seriously and I respect them. Um, But that's not my path. You know, my path is to find out from the conscious night side, like you say, getting into lab science side. Okay, actually, while I was at IONS, I'm doing the tests. Mm -hmm. A, a gray walks up behind me. Well, not it walks up, it appears. And I do think there's like a biofield, by the way. So something can come behind me, even though I'm focusing in front, so I can see it. I and I don't, it's not like I feel it. I can see this thing getting closer. Um, and I'm like, shit, what should I do? Because my head's hooked up to the EG machine. I'm trying to do this test. I there's no corruption, it's very strict. I'm like, okay, it will go away. Um, so it showed up a couple of times. I completely ignored it and it went away. So If this test, if there was another type of test we would have been taking, we could have studied my EEG waves while these, this being showed up. So that is in fact provable. That is in fact repeatable. I can get in a lab and see what happens because many times when I do this, things show up, right? It's like, maybe, maybe it's like singing in a forest. Something's going to hear you and it's going to pay attention. Again, I don't know. It's so new. Um, but it's cool and it's fun <laughs> and it can be scary at times, but it can be extremely exciting at times too. So that's one of the times. And that was one of the, probably the most um, extraordinary exchanges I've had or things I've seen in, yeah. the, in there. It, it really sounds a lot like, you know, anybody who's ever looked into any of these things like the gateway process or, um, you know, remote viewing where 
of course, if you're skeptical, the first thing you're going to think is like, what? This this sounds like absolute nonsense. Like you can take what? Like you can non-locally view things. But obviously, I don't need to tell you and I don't need to tell most people listening that the government was deeply invested in this process, studied this process. Like, you know, there's been movies made about uh, Project Stargate and all of its other names. Um, this was a huge intelligence and counterintelligence operation i don't know maybe maybe not huge but significant that during the cold war we were actively trying to use psychic spies to spy on the russians and russian assets and they were also doing it to us and we know this stuff a lot of this stuff has been declassified a lot of these people are still alive are doing interviews um seem very credible and a lot of the things that you're saying sound very similar to what they're saying in that some of them at least say that we live in this this they have words for it like uh, i think one of the words is like loose or like I, I can't remember but it's this idea that we're like living in an ecosystem of all kinds of things that we don't normally have the ability to see and some of them are not friendly it's like some of them are are not benevolent to put it mildly um so so yeah it i don't know do, do you have you looked into that stuff and do you have do you feel like that oh yeah could be similar to what's going on with you well, this is really funny, Michael, and it is really funny. So when I, in my book, I talk about these encounters, but I was always high, unreliable narrator, unreliable narrator on drugs. So it's kind of a fear and loathing, yeah, um, alien thing. But it happened, but I minimized it, right? Because I wanted to, because I, because I knew I had to include it, but I, there were some funny things that happened with the aliens, some embarrassingly funny but still funny. But it felt like they were, there was a reason I had to be separated from my family. So people talk about getting abducted. I was never abducted. You could make a case that maybe I was coerced. I don't know. Looking back, maybe it was a friendly, again, as, as a recovering addict, you know, I've been 11 years sober. Actually, I didn't say that at the beginning. I don't do any drugs because I knew I wasn't going to be taken serious. Or if I said it, I didn't say how long. So I don't do drugs. Um, and, and the unreliable narrator from the book, but those things did happen. And you can make a case looking back now, if you believe in that, right, that maybe they did a kinder, gentler separation from the family so they could look, look at me. And the fact that I was on St. John's right in the Bermuda Triangle does not escape me right on the water. Okay. When I was in California, I was right on the water. There may be an element to that. To answer your question, did, do I look into this? I did not get any response from the traditional academic community and I said, I am not going to New Age and I'm not going to ufology. I'm not going to do any of that. The only reason I finally did is Avril Haynes, the director of national security, is in Washington, D.C. at the National Cathedral in November of 2021. And she says, you know, we're studying extraterrestrials. We should look into extraterrestrials. It gave me the permission, the green light. I'm like, you know what? If they're saying it here, I'm going to start looking for answers there. Right. Yeah. So I did. And I started hanging out on UFO Twitter and don't do it. It's a shit show. And there's a lot of crap. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> it is, there's a lot of crap over there, but I needed that education for all the UFO attainment. Um, and I've met some cool people that like there, but uh, it's a lot of misdirection for the government. It doesn't matter why. My point is I've looked into it. There's something going on and it helped me get answers to, and to know to go to Dean Radin who yeah, studies right. high abilities. That's how I learned to do, to find out the people I should talk to. So I needed to, uh, I, I'm going to use this word, the UF Overton window, right? I need to do expand the UF Overton window and go outside my, my defined per, uh, parameters to actually look over there because even though they don't have all the answers, they know something's going on and they helped me point to the direction to help me get answers. But, 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 but. I definitely want to go back to the consciousness side and the ser not that yeah. they're not serious academics. I want to prove it. I don't want to wait for somebody else to come forward for a whistleblower to come behind the yeah. scene and say, we've got zero point energy. No, I, we can do this with the right people and I can help do it, whatever it is, if that makes sense. Does totally. that answer your question? It, it does. And I think you're really smart to focus on the consciousness aspect and, and what you can control aspect because the the ufo and extra dimensional or whatever intelligence question is such an epistemological and ontological landmine that as, as soon as you allow for that it'll to your point it becomes an absolute shit show because you can't dismiss anything now because you've you've opened up this portal 
where not only the good comes through, but anybody's nonsense comes through. And that is way too much to sort through. Um, Bernardo Castro, the um, idealist philosopher, um, I've talked to a couple of times, really brilliant guy in a number of ways, technically very brilliant, computer science PhD and and a philosophy PhD. Um, he got really interested in the UFO question and was starting to kind of like test the waters of that community. And last time I talked to him, he's just like, I'm, I'm out. Like, it's just too, it's just too, there's too much. Like, I think there's something going on here and I'm, I obviously find it interesting. How could I not find it interesting? But it, it's too, like, you can't keep a clear head in this space. There's, and, and, and he's seen people that he respects go from seeming very clear eyed to like, you're not seeing reality clearly anymore. And, and I think that, so to that point, I think you're smart to stick with consciousness what you can demonstrate, what you can directly influence, because you can't, I mean, I don't know. Like to me, that's a play, that's a fun place to play, but it's, I I don't expect that I'm going to get any, no, you know, hardcore disclosure. And and we live in a time now where even if we got disclosure, we'd be like, oh, that's bullshit. Because we're not going to believe the disclosure, (laughs) you know, like, yeah. Yeah. So forget disclosure, but Crash is great. And he wrote a great piece a couple of months ago about non-human intelligence. I mean, yeah. I read it with a fine tooth comb. I'm like, okay, this guy definitely, he may know more than he says. I'm like, oh, hold on. He knows something up. Something's up. So yeah, he's great. He's the perfect example of an intelligent person in the space that knows something that's going on. Um, um, and it presents it in a way that you're like, I get it. Uh, so God, I lost my train of thought. Damn it. Um, so, but he's good. I, yeah. Consciousness side of it. I don't expect anything about a disclosure. Forget it. I, for a while I did. Don't get me wrong. I was excited because of, again, because I was like, oh, maybe the answers, because yeah. obviously I want answers, you know, but I know I can do things that I don't need them to, um, uh, I don't need permission or, you know, you don't want to wait for somebody else. I can here, l- let me give you a perfect real world example. And this is funny because this is about money and AI. Tons of people throw money at AI, right? But go, you make it. If somebody wanted to study upside and evolutionary intelligence, this could be a space that we could absolutely start a business and get attention and find other people with it. And it, you'd be like, okay, we, this is its own science. It's its own space with its own results that can help men in many ways, humanity in many ways. Um and that, to me, whether people want to invest in business is the measure of the success of something. Again, I ran a small business. I ran an aid agency. I was involved with some startups and stuff like that. So the idea that people who are grounded down to earth want to invest in something like that is a tell that they think there's something there. Now, mm-hmm. to present to them in a way that says, okay, what's the return? Well, you know, that, that can't, we can't get into that now. But there's definitely, definitely ways to do that. Hmm. Interesting. Is that something you're trying to do? Well, yeah. And just think about it. Think about this microbiology and chem. You know, all these things. There, that's a business. Chemistry. Yeah. And AI is a business. Yeah. That's what the the piece I wrote on um on Medium is. You know, it's it's going to make a dark matter revolution. It's going to make AI look like a middle school science project. Keep in mind, <laughs> this was written before AI last year. Oh, AGI right. it really blew out. up. So, yeah. You know, yeah. Even though I still believe it, the AI is really, really, really come a long way since it's, I've seen it because. Yeah. Really important point. The things that I see, I have not seen anywhere mathematics, like Penrose kind of mathematics, and even in AI, when they put these questions to AI, they never come back with the right answer or they never come back with the structure that I'm seeing. And I think that's extremely important. Now, once we build it and I make a software out of it and put it in, what the AI does with does, what the AI does with it may be a little scary. I don't know. We're not there yet. Yeah. Well, yeah, that would be an interesting combination if you could figure out a way to form a collision or symbiosis between whatever you're experiencing and AI. I I don't know, because that seems that seems like that if AI is anything, it is a portal to making highly technical, boring, rote data available just like that. So if you're if you're able to somehow turn your experience into demonstrable data, that would be, I don't, I don't really know what it would mean, but I'm sure that there would be, there, there would be something there, but we're, we're right at the two hour mark, man. This has been a fun, a fun lap around the mystery with you. Is is there anything burning 
burning in your back pocket that you, you still want to show? Well, if somebody wants to follow, you can follow. I actually, yeah. If you have Upside Vision, there's an Upside Vision Facebook page with 27 of us on there. If you want to share your experience or whatever. Um, and if you want, I'm on Twitter, Tom E. Matt, M-A-T-T-E. And if you're curious about my my origin story, it's Jesus Goes to Hollywood, A Memoir of Madness. Very easy read. Very easy read. Um, but no, this has been a pleasure, Michael. I mean, a real absolute pleasure. And uh, you came at it from a philosophical perspective, which is nice and new to me. And I really appreciate your insights that you brought to this conversation. I thank you very much. Thank you, man. It was a lot of fun. I, I enjoyed it. Let's do it. Let, if there's any developments, let's do it again sometime. Definitely.